Welcome back to another episode of The Boat Boss. This is actually Boat Boss 2.0, where I have the chance to go back and interview some of the major executives that I interviewed almost four years ago. This one was actually three years ago. I interviewed the CEO, Dave Folks, the CEO of Brunswick Corp. He is one of the movers and shakers in the industry and probably one of the hardest working individuals I know. So Dave, welcome back to The Boat Boss. It is great to be here again, Kim. Thank you for having me. Well, as you know, you've worked for Brunswick for quite some time, but those of uh, new to my audience or some new to the industry, Brunswick is a $6 billion company. It is the world leader in recreational boating. They do marine engines, parts, technology, you name it. They are winning the game on the water. It has been, like I said, three years since we've been together. And I want to talk about a little bit about what's happened in your life. So tell me, do you have grandkids yet? Has Emma and Michael <laughs> given you any grandkids yet? <laughs> no, we're not quite at that stage yet. They, they continue to be very career focused. My son, Michael, is still working in Chicago and really enjoying himself, traveling the world with his company, which he's very excited about. And Emma lives in Boston still and is, is uh, thriving there with her friend group and, and doing very well. And of course, my wife, uh, Jillian, and I continue to spend as much time as we can on the water. And when we're not, we spend it with kids and we can, whatever time we spend, we, we try and do something useful with. Well, you talk about doing something useful. Mm -hmm. Useful is boating in our eyes. Have you been on mm -hmm. your Boston Whaler lately? Uh, yes. About uh, a week ago, we were on it uh, for the first time this season. Uh, we're, we boat out of Chicago and the harbor's open on the 1st of May. So... Uh, we were on it maybe a couple of weeks ago, and we plan to get on it again uh, this weekend, weather permitting. Oh, that's good. I know the weather's been a little crazy lately in the world, mm -hmm. especially here in South Florida. Yeah, that's something we need. Uh, we need a, we need that good weather to uh, to provide a tailwind for us. Well, add it to my manifesting and, and praying list, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's dive right into Brunswick. Um, you are, like I said, the busiest man in the industry, 60 brands underneath uh, your tutelage. And I wanted to also mention to my audience that, you know, it's not just the business, but it's the people behind the business. There's the internal mm -hmm. customer and the external customer, which is obviously mm -hmm. people like me and my clients. But let's talk about the internal customer. You know, in order mm -hmm. to win in the marketplace, you have to win in the workplace. And I wanted to go through some of the awards that Brunswick has won. I'm going to read them here because there's quite a lot of them. For the sixth consecutive year, you have been named one of the world's best employers by Forbes and one of the most responsible companies, which is a big word these days, mm -hmm. by Newsweek. Brunswick was also named to the 2023 list of best companies to work for by the U.S. News and World Report and one of America's most responsible companies by Newsweek. Huge I mean, that is massive, you know, awards that you've won. Um, how have you accomplished this culture? And, and they say the old saying, what you practice in private, you get rewarded for in public. How have you done this? It's a team effort, as you can imagine, um, Kim. I think, you know, we have a leadership team that values this culture of um, respect and collaboration and uh, making people feel they belong to something. I think we've all, as a leadership team, worked in, in various different uh, organizations and various different sectors of industry. And we found um, work environments that we really enjoy and some that are a bit more challenging. Uh, and I think we've all to come together to try and create something that we enjoy and that is uh, something that attracts people and retains people to our organization. Having a, a, a strong culture, uh, a culture that people want to work in, is just super important in attracting uh, the best people. And we've been able to attract the best people from outside the industry because technology uh, requires it and our products and manufacturing uh, requires it. And we've been able to retain people for long periods of time. I know a lot of people who have been to with- It's hard to do, it's hard to do. Yeah, Brunswick for 40 and 50 years. And that is an amazing thing for it's me. Huge. Yeah, I want to create a culture that I'm comfortable working in and that makes me want to come to work every day. And that's what I want for everybody in the company. Couldn't agree more. Having a safe mm -hmm. place, one that mm -hmm. they can actually grow mm -hmm. personally and professionally is so important. But, you know, one thing that I mm -hmm. wanted to really, really stress on, every company has the pillars of success. Mm -hmm. What are your pillars here at Brunswick? 
We have quite a few, I mean, I'll just pick a few, but innovation is one of them. I know that we're a very innovative company and we, we embed that in our culture. Authenticity is uh, important to us. We like people to be who they are in our organization, be comfortable with being who they are, bring their full self to work. But we have another pillar, which is excellence. Um, so it is very important that uh, you never see an, uh, the kind of culture that we have as somehow not driving excellence. It is intended to drive excellence. We all, we all know that this is not about a sprint. You can stress people out and, and over deliver on one occasion, but then they get burned out. And this is about, a, it's a marathon and people work better in an environment where they feel included and where they feel they'll be listened to and, and their presence and their contributions are respected. So we, we are constantly thinking about that as we continue to be a high performing organization. Well, they call that mindfulness. Mm -hmm. You are definitely a mindful mm -hmm. leader and a lot of the people that I have dealt with at Brunswick mm -hmm. and Mercury and a lot of your companies are all share that same mindset. Um, the new motto, if you will, that came out recently, mm -hmm. or I'm going to show a video in a little bit about, about what next never rests mean. And to me, when I first heard it, I thought, okay, mindfulness, mm -hmm. innovation, the future, but I was putting words into your mouth. What is, mm -hmm. what does that mean both to your internal customer at Brunswick and external? What does next never rest mean? Yeah, it's a, a tagline, if you like, that we came out with at the beginning of last year. We actually introduced it, I think, very appropriately at the Consumer Electronics Show in 2023, because that is the kind of environment that we operate in. We, we are um, successful in many fields, in many areas of the marine industry, but we never want to rest on our laurels because we know that disruption is always just around a corner. And so disrupting yourself is very important uh, and continuing to invest in innovation and technology and even new business models, for example, shared access models like the Freedom Boat Club model. We constantly challenge ourselves to think around the corner. And that is really what next never rests for us. Don't never take for granted what you have in any in any environment, in any context, uh, keep striving. Uh, and keep innovating and keep being creative and keep investing is really what um, Next Never Rest means to me. Well, what's that saying? You need to be comfortable with being uncomfortable? Yes, that's exactly <laughs> right. And you definitely, um, that is what that is all about. <laughs> So, you know, you're one of my favorite CEOs. I love um, just the talks that we have, whether it's the boat show or we catch each other uh, on a video chat. Um, owning the vertical is something that I really respect from a lot of organizations. A lot of them don't do it very well and some do it very well. You're one of them. Karen Lynch, the CEO of CVS, does it very well. I wanted to really, Marine Max has done it well. How do you, Dave Folks, the CEO of Brunswick, how have you mastered the vertical? Let's talk about how you did it and what challenges you had in owning so many different brands that touched the single client throughout the boat ownership? Uh, yeah, I think wherever you um, participate, you're looking to create value. And so we're, we're constantly looking at pockets of value. Once you find that pocket, then you kind of work out what's the ecosystem around it that allows you to create even more value um, out of it. And, and one of those strategies is um, kind of backwards integration, vertical integration into the supply chain, if you like. Another is forward integration, uh, more integrating into the channel or go to market strategy. And we've worked on both of those. You mentioned we're about a $6 billion company, but more than half a billion dollars of that is synergy sales, if you like. It's sales of Mercury engines and Navico Group mm -hmm. products to our boat group sales of our boat group boats to Freedom Boat Club. That is a unique differentiated part of our model. And what that results in is higher aggregate um, profit margins in the products that we sell. And then it accelerates, for example, the impact of Freedom Boat Club because Freedom is not only its own P&L, but it also drives sales in other parts of the organization. The thought process, you never want to vertically integrate everything. You're never going to be good at everything so you are constantly thinking about where do where does opportunity and capability intersect 
to allow us to create more value. Mm -hmm. And that is a unique part of our organization, as, as we said before, and we'll continue to look for it. And sometimes you can be very intentional about that. You know what you're looking for and you drive it. Sometimes it's a bit of a learning process. You're going forward and then you see, oh, if I make this next step. For example, um, when we bought Freedom Boat Club, we were thinking about, okay, how do you dispose of these boats that come out of freedom after two or three years? Right, right. It's not something that we've had to think about before, but we set up a digital pre-owned boat sales platform called Boteca. Mm -hmm. And that was a bit of a learning experience for us. Um, how do we create this kind of certified pre-owned type model in marine that uh, doesn't really exist? It exists in automotive, but not in marine. So we're intentional about it sometimes, and sometimes it's a bit more logical and predictable, but sometimes we find opportunities and, and evaluate them, but we're constantly looking for them. Yeah, I was actually intrigued by that, that, um, you know, your certified pre-owned model. I, I had a chance to research it myself, Merritt Island, Tampa, mm -hmm. or Clearwater and Georgia. Mm -hmm. How is that working out for Brunswick? It's working out very well. Um, I think that um, that is a missing tier in a lot of ways in the marine space. We have uh, new boats and then we have pre-owned boats, but the idea of CPO really is that you refurbish the boat to some extent, bring it up to a minimum level with mm -hmm. some kind of multi-point check or multi-point evaluation. And then you typically add warranty or some other thing that mm -hmm. gives uh, the buyer confidence that the work that you've done will result in longevity for the product. Uh, but it's still less costly than a, a new boat. Uh, and Absolutely. we found that our um, margins there are strong, and we've definitely found a buyer that is looking for that extra level of uh, refurbish refurbishment and the extra confidence, for example, the, that an additional supplementary warranty provides. It's been an interesting Absolutely. learning experience, and it's it's working very well for us. Well, that's so true. Commu mm -hmm. uh, the consumer confidence when you buy a pre-owned boat, mm -hmm. that's an area that we're all challenged with. Mm -hmm, on mm -hmm. both sides. So good hats off to you on that. Mm -hmm. Let's dive right into and the last time we spoke, we talked about your ACES innovation strategy. Mm -hmm. um, I want to readdress you know, four points, if you will, mm -hmm. or the points that make up that strategy. Um, we talk about autonomy and uh, mm -hmm. it's heard that your strategy is better than what we're seeing in the auto industry, mm -hmm. um, the ADAS strategy. Let's mm -hmm. talk about the components that make up your innovation strategies. Let's start with the autonomy. I'm excited about that. I think it's not a yeah. replacement for boat um, mm -hmm. operations, but mm -hmm. let's talk about what Brunswick is doing in that area. Yeah, you're exactly right. I think uh, operating a boat is part of the boating experience. Um, so if you think about autonomy and um, passenger vehicles, they're typically trying to detach the driver from the driving experience. They really like to get from A to B, you know, ideally without touching the wheel or the pedals or, or whatever. That's not what we're intending to do. We're focused very much on what are the more stressful situations in boating that might be a deterrent for somebody either going boating or buying a boat or maybe a family member who is reluctant to operate the boat. Uh, and so our uh, focus is really in those areas. One of those is docking. Obviously, we've all had those experiences where there are 20 people watching you, uh, you know, dock your big boat and, and um, boats have a lot of momentum and latency and there are winds and waves and currents and all kinds of things going on. So if you're experienced, that's fine. If you're a bit less experienced, it can be a bit intimidating. And so we have um, been developing a system that does auto docking. Uh, and we've demonstrated it now a number of times uh, to the media and, and to other people, and it's uh, coming along extremely well. That's and great. we plan to bring it to market uh, in the next uh, couple of years. Once you have that kind of technology on board a boat, um, the sensor suite, which is mostly stereo cameras, and the ability to recognize objects in the environment, then you can use it in a lot of other different ways for object avoidance, object detection, autopilot functionality, those kind of things. But uh, our initial focus is on that automated docking experience. Well, one of the platform initiatives that we have here uh, on the Boat Boss now has become boating safety. It's at the forefront of what we do. Uh, it's been something that I really haven't spent a lot of time you know, focusing on, and it's really 
at the forefront now. So I'm really excited to learn more about that. So keep us in, you know, I'll definitely yeah, do a Boat Boss 3.0 on that. <laughs> so Freedom Boat Club, you know, yeah. people ask me why I'm such an advocate of the shared model. Not everyone is meant to be a boat owner or somebody that is new to boating might want to try. It. You've done very well with Freedom Boat Club. It, it has been a real success for us. We're really delighted with the way it's uh, progressed. Um, we acquired Freedom Boat Club, so we didn't, uh, you know, it wasn't a completely bootstrap model. We, we acquired the business in 2019, mm -hmm. uh, six months into my uh, tenure as um, CEO. It had 170 locations and I, I think about 25,000 members. So we, we just passed 410 locations, 100,000 members. We have um, many clubs in the US, Canada, all over Europe, uh, the first eight or nine locations in Australia now. So it has really been very successful. It is like a golf club. You pay an initiation fee and then you pay monthly yeah. subscription and then the boat is ready when you arrive and then you drop it off. Yeah. You don't need to do anything other than have fun, go boating. So if you are under time pressure or maybe not comfortable with dealing with uh, maintenance and service and insurance and storage and all those kind of things, it is the perfect alternative. Absolutely. I think, you know, it continues to grow really quickly. One of the interesting things is, of course, over the last several years, we've experienced inflation, we've experienced mm -hmm. high interest rates. Both of those things affect the purchase of durable goods like boats, but they haven't really impacted freedom. Uh, so That's the joining fees, the subscription mm -hmm. fees are, um, are fairly constant. So it's an affordable way to go boating too. One of the words that we shared earlier is what mm. keeps me up at night is the sustainability mm -hmm. of my business and, and the industry. And I really mm -hmm. believe truly that a shared model like Freedom and the others, you know, are out there. It gives mm -hmm. those that are have a barrier to boating entry. Mm -hmm. Diversity is a big initiative at mm -hmm. Brunswick. How have you contributed to breaking down the barriers with the Freedom Boat Club model? Yeah, there's a lot that you can do. One of the things of, for people who come from a background of boating, insurance and service and maintenance and storage and finding a slip and all those things might come naturally. If your family's been on the water, if you've got relatives on the water, you have um, guidance and advice available to you. For people coming from to boating, maybe from non-traditional backgrounds, it's all a bit, it's just a lot. It is different from owning a car. We all know that. Um, and so if we can find a way to bring people into voting and take away a lot of the things that, that might worry them or they might um, not be barriers. able to find information on a lot of the barriers, then that is a way of encouraging a, a more diverse group into voting. And that I, means... I, I had heard 35% of your clients and freedom are women. Is that true? That they are. Um, and we sell it. We completely celebrate that. And I think uh, finding a, demographics are changing over mm -hmm. time and we need to uh, find ways of making sure that we continue to stay relevant to as large a portion of the population as we possibly can. And that means being uh, accessible and interesting and easy for uh, men, women, you know, people of different ethnic uh, backgrounds, people who live in uh, metropolitan areas versus in suburban or rural areas. So that that is freedom finds it as a great way to to provide that additional accessibility. Well, let's move on to innovation. Because innovation is the only way to win, as Steve Jobs said. <laughs> and uh, with the purchase of the Navico Group, how has that helped you stay in at the forefront of innovation and leading the market? If you yeah, if you think about where what are the technological trends in boating that have really come through in the last kind of 10, 15 years, of course, we've been a big part of the propulsion innovation trend with Mercury Marine. Mm -hmm. But you have to say that boats are now packed with electronics, whether it's mm -hmm. large touchscreens or radar or sonar or digital switching systems that allow you to control all of the features on a boat from a single touchscreen many more electrical features, whether it's entertainment or comfort, you know, air conditioning, refrigeration, all these electronics. So um, boats are just much more sophisticated now and, and really growing in electronic and electrical content. And that's where Navico Group really comes in for us. It has all of those things. And the key, I think, things work together better if they're designed to work together 
better. If you design them separately and then try and connect them, that's where some of the problems happen. So Navico Group's ability to design everything to work together, to be compatible, to be plug and play is, I think, a big advantage uh, for us commercially and to the end consumer and to the boat OEM uh, in the middle, who is you know tasked with bringing all of this technology to the consumer and maybe doesn't necessarily have all of the skills and capabilities available in their own organizations to do it. So our ability to partner and, and help them deliver that experience in a seamless way is, is a key rationale for Navico Group. Absolutely. And it keeps us boating. You know, if a great experience on the water, <laughs> you're more likely to return back to the water and buy an Yes, you are. <laughs> so let's talk about the hot buzzword right now is mm. EV, both on and off the mm. water. I know um, Brunswick and Mercury are at the forefront of that. Where do you stand? I know three years ago was a thought, four years ago when we were talking, mm. three years ago when you came on my show, where does Brunswick stand now in Mercury on the uh, electric propulsion? Yeah, it, it's been you know, a pretty fast transition for us from the strategy of what you know how we could approach um, electrifying marine to having a lot of products in the marketplace now. We, we have... We just launched the fourth and fifth products in our Avatar electric outboard mm -hmm. product line, which is part of the Mercury Marine uh, product line. Uh, we acquired um, Flightboard late last year, which is the electric bringing um, sexy back. surfing company. It. We are, <laughs> and then for those bigger boats where electric propulsion is not uh, possible at the moment, um, where we've brought in a system called Fathom that allows you to replace the onboard generator with. Uh, high capacity mm -hmm. lithium ion battery system. So we've gone from strategy to a full suite of products, which is very exciting for me, for the organization, and I think for the industry. Just this week, early this week, we had our first all electric media day down in uh, Charleston, uh, I think it nice. was. We had five avatars mm -hmm. in the product line, plus mm -hmm. the flight lineup, including the most affordable of the flight boards that we actually launched in Miami this year, the Flight Air, which is a $6,000 e-foil. So, um, yeah, we're very excited about that part of the product Hello. line. And I think, you know, it's so nice. Uh, electrification is naturally difficult in the marine industry. Boats are more like airplanes than they are like road vehicles. They're very weight sensitive. They need a lot of power. They don't have brakes to regenerate energy. Exactly. But finding a way um, to electrify a portion of the marine product line is very exciting. Mm -hmm. and, and we're very proud and excited about the future uh, of um, expanding those product lines. Yeah, I am too. And I think part, you know, mm -hmm. what we all need to do is we need to give it a chance. Yeah. And that's, you know, a lot of people think mm -hmm. it's replacing mm -hmm. uh, fossil fuel and, and mm -hmm. other types of propulsion. Mm -hmm. It's not. What is the consumer that will, is ideal for that type of product? Mm -hmm. I, exactly right. There are applications for everything. I think we all know that electrification is not going to replace the bulk of engines in the marine industry for the foreseeable future, mm -hmm. unless there is a step change or several step changes in electric vehicle technology. But there are applications where it works really well, and those are the ones we're focusing on. Beyond that, though, there are other things that we can think about, mm -hmm. like synthetic fuels, alternative fuels, those kind of things. Their electrification is not the only way of decarbonizing propulsion systems and, and the industry. So we need to continue with a broad focus, I think. Absolutely. You have to think big for sure. Mm -hmm. So what does the future of the boating industry look like? It's a question that people ask me all the time. And for mm -hmm. me, you know, the Boat Boss platform is all about mm -hmm. education, initiatives, sustainability. Mm -hmm. Where does the, what does the future look like for our industry? Well, I think there are a lot of trends in our favor. I think we continue, obviously we go through economic cycles and we're all, you know, we've all experienced that and we'll continue to experience it. But if you look at some of the macro trends around increased leisure time, around wealth generation, you can see that there are very bright macro trends supporting our industry. But that doesn't mean we don't have to work at it. And that's really, in a lot of ways, what we've been talking about. How do we continue to create attractive, exciting, compelling products and experiences that are going to attract people into boating? particularly at demographic shift over time and people's um, experiences in other verticals change over time. We just need to keep ourselves very relevant. And if we keep ourselves very relevant, there's a very, very bright future for us. 
I couldn't agree more. And it's not just about creating the products, but it's also having a voice. And you do a very good job mm -hmm. of that. I always see you out there promoting the industry, promoting your people, your products. You're very passionate about what you do. I love one of my fans. I'm a big fan of Jim Cramer. I think he's awesome. <laughs> I've been watching him since 2005. You guys do a really good job. I think you have a future as his co-host someday. <laughs> I'm not sure if I go that far, but I appreciate it very much. And we always enjoy uh, being on Jim's show. Well, tell him I said hi. I'm a big <laughs> fan. And maybe someday I'll get to interview him. You never know. Well, listen, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on Boat Boss 2.0 with the CEO of Brunswick Day Folks. You are an amazing uh, person, an advocate for the industry, a great leader. And we appreciate everything you do for us. Wishing you only the best in the rest of 2024 and 2025. Hopefully be an even better year. Thank you, Kim, so much. I really appreciate you having me on the show. I certainly really appreciate everything you do for the industry, too. I greatly Thank appreciate you. it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right, everyone. Check back next for the next 2.0 Boat Boss. It's an exciting series where I'm bringing back all the major CEOs and executives that I interviewed to see where they are today.